guys with just the first question, just to talk about your research and your work more broadly um, in terms of maybe what got you to do, you know, what got you interested in the work that you have done, the research that you've done, um, and, uh, you know, just so that people who are not familiar with the work can you know a little bit more about you, and then we'll kind of get into some of the issues that we wanted and we agreed that we wanted to talk about. And maybe I'll start with Van. Yeah, thanks, and thanks everybody for coming. So I started my professional life in the national security state. So I was U.S. Air Force, uh, I worked in intelligence, they paid for my school, I went to school at night, I went to grad school, studied international relations to complement my, my day job. And then I got a, a policy gig at the time that I thought was a dream job in the Obama administration and working in his, his Pentagon. And that I did that during the daytime. I was doing my PhD at night, again, international relations. And so obviously focusing on like international security issues. And because uh, in the military I was a Korean linguist, I was uh, focused on East Asia for the most part, so like China and the Koreas and stuff like that. And I got out of that when I got my PhD. I started going into the think tank world, and I was still part of this national security machinery. Trump wins, and it was kind of like a holy shit moment for a lot of people. And it, it was the beginning of a kind of reckoning in a way, but um, a very slow reckoning. And then during the North Korean nuclear crisis in 2017, I was I happened to be positioned as like a scholar, pundit person, sort of commenting and worrying about what was happening and the, the risks of war that Trump was playing with. And during that time, Trump's making all these fire and fury threats. And then Kim Jong-un, North Korea's leader, starts making his own nuclear threats in return, naturally. Um, and as part of that escalation tit for tat, uh, one of Kim Jong-un's generals threatens to fire MRBMs uh, to bracket fire Guam. And I happen to have like some Pacific heritage, and so I, I was aware vaguely that Guam was one of the like 17 non-self-governing territories that are left in the world. It's, it wants nationhood, it doesn't get nationhood. Um, and it's also not a fully incorporated part of the federal system like, like Hawaii, right? So we maintain these like active, actual colonial relations with Guam. And so Kim Jong-un is threatening to nuke Guam not because of anything that Chamorro did, but because we have Anderson Air Force Base there. And because we have a really dumbass strategy that we're implementing that is courting risks of nuclear war that are, are avoidable. And so it dawned on me, like, why don't, what kind of injustice is this that the indigenous Chamorro, people who are denied self-determination in an active sense, we're exploiting the fact that they're denied self-determination so that we can do a bad strategy that risks killing everybody. And so there was this perverse way where like social justice and bad strategy, social injustice and bad strategy were like maybe somehow connected. And it made me question suddenly like who, who has to eat it on behalf of the choices that we make? And not just in Guam, but like everywhere else. Who else doesn't get a say in their fate because of the things that we do in foreign policy? You start asking questions like that, and then the answers that you find when you look at the history are not comfortable, and you can't unsee once you start seeing that. You know, um, And so I, I developed this commitment from that point gradually about like, making sure you know, you foreground who benefits and who is harmed by the choices that we make, and that's sort of the through line in my research ever since. But topically, it's still East Asia, the Pacific, US foreign policy, all this stuff, but with a sort of different orientation than I used to have. Uh, thanks for, is this one on? No? Is that, okay, cool, thank you. Um, I want to echo Van when he said, um, you start seeing things and you can't unsee them because that's sort of how I kind of view my career. Um, I It occurs to me that I might have to explain this for people here, but um, I got out of college having already been working as a reporter um, for, some, for a local outlet um, in New York, which is where I'm from, 
And 9-11 had happened a couple months earlier. And I knew I wanted to be in journalism. And to a degree that might not be true after, there was just this one story back then. It was the way in which the United States was going to respond to 9-11 and the ways in which entire aspects of that very transformational period shaped kind of the rest of American public life in ways that were both obvious and subtle. And I started doing that. And that took me to the battlefields of those wars that introduced me to the realities of the national security state, both profound and boring. I did a lot of reporting on surveillance. I did a lot of reporting on the CIA and its torture program on Guantanamo Bay. And certainly to Iraq and Afghanistan. And what became conspicuous about this was the ways in which election cycle would come and go, administrations would come and go, scandals would come and go. But this apparatus persisted. And it became so coterminous with US foreign policy more broadly that a whole lot of observers simply just sort of figured like the war on terror was something that was over. But the United States military is out of Afghanistan. It maintains what it calls an over the horizon capability in the kind of subtle language from Pakistan and then from naval positions to attack Afghanistan should it declare that to be in the US interest, which it doesn't have to answer to or necessarily explain itself both domestically or internationally. Because that's the reality of being a global and hegemonic power. The United States military is still in Iraq. It is in Syria, where it has been for, at this point, more than eight years. And while this doesn't often get discussed in these terms in the United States, the United States presence in Syria, whatever you might think about it as a valid or invalid proposition, is illegal under international law. Whatever you think about the government of Bashar Assad, it shouldn't exist in my opinion. He is a war criminal and ought to be charged and treated as one. Nevertheless, he is the government of Syria. And absent an international mandate, the United States does not have the right to militarily occupy Syria. And those are the sorts of things, to go back to what Van was saying, is that you kind of can't unsee when you sort of start unraveling the sweater. But what you also can't see, what you also can't unsee, is the human impact of these wars, not only on their battlefields, but how they impact what the United States does to its own people. Not just in terms of the socioeconomic contingent that is enlisted to fight these wars, to face consequences for these wars when the architects of them never will. And there are some rather dramatic examples of how that manifests. But also the ways in which constant warfare, perpetual warfare, the resource choices that it demands and imposes, shapes American politics, even as the common conception is that the war on terror is over. It not only nurtures really atavistic feelings of internal fury over the possibility of humiliation abroad, but also internal betrayal at home. And as I kept reporting on these issues, it really seemed like there was, just from my position in newsrooms, an enormous divergence between the people who would report on politics, which would often mean reporting on elections as well as reporting on policy, but also reporting on national security and foreign affairs, as few of us as there became over these last 20 years. And that became a really, I think, journalistic disservice. 
because we ended up, as we talked about foreign affairs, lacking a way of materially grounding both why these things were happening and how they manifested in the United States. How an era in which enormous amounts of money were made, giant fortunes were made, in many ways, if you take a drive through northern Virginia, the enormous wealth that is now very visibly displayed in the places where like the Pentagon is in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. are, meant that when, you know, large land wars drew down, there's all of this stuff that goes into servicing a war, particularly surveillance stuff. Enormous, powerful cameras that can take, you know, megapixel imagery over, you know, acres at a time. The Air Force is great at this. That's all been developed and now it needs a market. And where do these markets end up taking shape? They take shape in forms of police precincts around the country, of grant, you know, funded by counterterrorism grants that are still in place from the Department of Homeland Security. So the militarization of American policing is a sort of Mobius strip with the militarization of American foreign policy. And the last thing I'll just say on this, because I ended up writing a book on it, is that what permanent war does is it opens a doorway to the most nativist, unsubtle, anti-democratic, and lawless forces that have always existed within the history of the United States of America and encouraged by the economy of the United States of America, back to power. And while, and it would drive me kind of crazy in 2016 when I would see, you know, descriptions of Trump, you know, talking about bombing the shit out of people and banning Muslims from entering the United States described as this kind of alternative to the war on terror, rather than inevitable manifestation of it. And similarly, it drove me crazy to see Joe Biden run for president without having to account for his enormous role in shaping what the war on terror was, as well as, you know, what we are seeing right now in terms of the slaughter in Gaza. How many times during Biden's 50 years in politics, which coincide with, after 1973, Henry Kissinger brings Israel, you know, firmly and irrevocably into the United States orbit, and that's where this kind of era of impunity really begins to take off for Israel. But I think now as I talk to people, after October 7th, I kind of no longer have to give my typical spiel arguing about how the war on terror has not in fact ended, because what we've seen over the past six months is in many ways the recrudescence of the war on terror, the reassertion of it under, you know, its vast, limitless, violent, and censorious prerogatives to the point where now you see not just the machinery of U.S. government surveillance, but like adjuncts calling for the surveillance of people espousing speech they disagree with and calling that a pretext for material support for terrorism charges being brought. I wrote an article about this for The Nation. This is something that the Anti-Defamation League put out to campuses around the country, I believe 200 of them, calling for investigations of their local chapters of both Students for Palestine, Students for, Students for Palestine, and also Jewish Voice for Peace, demonstrating that this is not, you know, a Jew, Muslim, or even really an Israeli-Palestinian thing, but a Zionist and non-Zionist as a relevant divide. And that coincided with the Biden administration under pretext of fighting anti-Semitism, making it much easier for campuses to invite the Department of Homeland Security with its vast powers 
to surveil and detain onto campuses, bringing the machinery of the war on terror that once created never goes away, never gets repealed, and finds ever more um, domestic purpose to unleash it. And with that, I'll stop talking. Thank you. Hi. Um, is this on? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'll just say a few words to, to uh, give some background. So I studied the history of Western democracy, uh, the origins of democratic institutions, the dynamics of political development in, in these democracies, which seems like a fairly straightforward and innocuous topic, um, but it actually is not at all. And I came to it in a really circuitous way. Um, it's actually not very broadly studied in my field at all. And I actually initially went to grad school uh, to study how to spread democracy in the Middle East, you know, me and everyone else. Um, so I was going to grad school to figure out how to spread democracy in the Middle East, and it took maybe five minutes for me to drop that topic. Um, and I remember very vividly, it was my first semester of grad school where I was in a, a seminar of um, democratization, and we were studying these different definitions of democracy, and they made absolutely no sense to me. It was, like, they were circular, and it wasn't, it was as if they had been retrofit to existing established democracies and so many inconsistencies. So why civil rights and not economic rights? Why this and not that? Like what, what are the things that landed in these definitions that made them our definitions of democracy? Uh, and I, had, I remember this very heated exchange with the professor who actually became a mentor eventually, but it was a very heated exchange that ended with him saying, you know what, I'm a, we actually don't know what democracy is. And that was a very honest statement. And we don't know what democracy is. But for me, this is my, you know, me, my, my first semester of graduate school, this was a watershed. You know, what do you mean we don't know what democracy is? What are we out, democracy, like we're democracy promoting. We're luring it all over the world with these democracies. So what are we doing and what are we talking about? And it was one of those, you know, stop everything. I'm going to take a look. Um, and I basically spent my entire career taking a look at these democracies, looking at their histories. And I will say, I've been discouraged at every step. Mm -hmm. um, initially, I was told, number one, this topic is passe. Nobody's looking at the history of these democracies anymore, Western Europe and the US. Uh, I was told it was not in my comparative advantage to pursue this topic because my language skills, my familiarity with the Middle East would put me ahead. That argument never made much sense to me because it's not an advantage if it's not interesting to you. Um, but so there were many, you know, obstacles for a while. Nobody would work with me, and you know, if I was advising someone in graduate school right now, and they told me no one would work with them, I would say you should probably leave that program. Uh, but I was kind of clueless about all of this, and I was also very, very stubborn, so I kept digging. And um, eventually, someone did come along who was very enthusiastic about the topic, and I was able to work on it. Um, but in doing that, it became very clear that the history of Western democracy is not what we think it is that no one has studied it since the 1950s, which is surreal. And um, you know, it, it, it's a way for understanding not only the historical deficits in these democracies, but the current deficits. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a way, you know, I think one of the best gifts of graduate school was me discovering my love of history, which for me, history is not something that gives you a roadmap for the future. I think that's a very, uh, it, 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 it's a, suspect way of looking at history because then you start looking for models that you're going to apply everywhere. For me, history became a way of centering ourselves in the present, of denaturalizing certain structures, and thinking of more possibility-filled ways for the future. So I keep turning to history, and I turn to the his our history over and over again because there's so many things that we look around us and we think, well, this is, this is how it is, therefore this is how things have to be. Um, and there are various points where we can make different choices. Historically, we have made different choices. And in terms of thinking about US democracy and Western democracy is one of the areas where they are notably and really extraordinarily undemocratic is in the area of foreign policy, um, which is so tremendously sheltered from public opinion, from, from any sort of grassroots mobilization. Um, it's one of the topics that I think we'll be talking about today. but. Um, this remains an area where there are very few people working in my field. I think we, we um, at last count, there are five of us who study the US 
as a democratic political system. I think it's extraordinarily important. I think it's, I think it's becoming clear how important it is um, for, for all sorts of areas in, in which you know, these matters become important. So, stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, so much. And actually, I just read a recent article of yours about this idea of democratic backsliding and it's become a common sense thing that there's democratic backsliding in the US, but if we don't know what we mean by democracy, how can we say that there's democratic backsliding or is it something that's always existed? So you kind of lay out what we kind of think about when, what we mean by democratic backsliding, which is a really interesting topic. So maybe we'll come to that in a second. Um, Van, I wanted to go back to you and ask you about, you, I mean, you're based in New Zealand and you cover the Pacific region uh, quite a bit. You did so in, in the book Pacific Power Paradox, but you've given a lot of thought about the impact of great power competition internationally and, and what is you know what it looks like, this kind of um, doctrine that's now been adopted by the US since 2017 officially, I believe, that you know the US is in competition with China and Russia. Um, it's become a common sense thing in DC. Um, it's fueling all sorts of think tank pieces and all sorts of strategies and you know it's it's all over the place um but tell us a little bit i mean you, you've also given a lot of thought about you know what does it mean for the u.s to be seeking primacy and and pursuing this rivalry with china what does it mean in terms of its alliances what does it mean in terms of kind of the the, the impact that it has internationally yeah i mean so Ever since the 80s, at least, and some people dated way before that, but for sure by the 80s, the U.S. had started articulating publicly that it had uh, a vital national interest in sustaining primacy. And then they would go on to define primacy very specifically as actual preeminence in military, political, and economic life. I mean, and primacy is, is domination and in the, the, the security literature where we develop like models of grand strategies and such, primacy is a specific type of grand strategy that involves literally domination, literally keeping everyone down, even if they're your friends, if they appear to be approaching your power, right? your power parity, right? So that, and that, be, that became a really vocal thing in the early 90s. Um, and we just put a nice shine on it during the sort of Clinton unipolar era. Um, but that was a through line for like 40 plus years of U.S. foreign policy, and maybe another 80 years before that, depending on how you define it. But um, in the in the post Cold War, primacy. This this all comes back to great power competition. It all comes back to China because it's a continuation of the same tradition. So the idea of like primacy and domination in the post-Cold War moment when the other peer competitor superpower dissolves means you, by, by default you inherit this position of primacy. Unipo primacy is the strategy that requires unipolarity, where you're the sole concentrated great power in the system. And so in that context, a strategy of primacy is kind of easy in the sense that you don't have to do much, you've inherited the position for it by default. And so if you're just trying to upkeep that, then you know, if some if another power seems to be sort of challenging to you, then you, you whack them down, you, you cause problems for them in some way. And we saw Japan sort of emerging like that in the eighties. Japan was the China before China, right? So the yellow peril, we had we had Japan was an ally of ours, and we had military bases in their country, and we still worried that they were going to take over the world in the 80s. I know you guys have seen Die Hard, you know? Like, that's always, it's just in the backdrop, or Rising Sun or something. And so, it's only because Japan's economy went into a long-term recession starting in 1990, and therefore, if it was no longer rising, that it became like, okay, we don't have to worry about them. Also, they were our ally the whole time, so what were we? What were we freaking out about? <laughs> but uh, so all to say, for a long time we maintained a strategy of privacy, but it was easy to do for us and not especially costly for us. Quite costly for the world. Quite costly for the working classes, in fact, uh, in ways that I'm happy to explain. But it seemed easy to us because we didn't count those costs. We only counted the costs to like our our war machine, foreign policy establishment, 
GDP, these things that look like really good and shiny. The problem is that distributions of power have changed, become more diffuse over time. This is a function of technology. It's a function of capital accumulation in the world economic system. Um, and because power is diffusing sort of away from the United States in relative terms over time, um, and China has never been an ally with the United States. It, was, it is not a subordinate client state like Japan was. Um, so all the yellow peril stuff that was there in the 80s, it's there now targeted at China. China, not an ally, not subordinated, has some interests that are antagonistic to us and vice versa that happens sometimes in the world. Um, but it's turned into this big yellow peril thing because it challenges our ability to sustain privacy, in Asia specifically. We kind of don't have primacy anymore. And that's a huge problem given that our strategy is primacy. So what I'm saying is the, dis the, the global distribution of power, in essence, made primacy easy once upon a time. Our primacy strategy has not really changed, but the requirements of sustaining that same old strategy are now wildly higher and riskier. They require us to do, you have to run faster and harder to maintain the same position, right, as the world changes. So now, if we're trying to be dominant in a world where we are actually less dominant, what well, we have to start kneecapping our enemy, containment strategies, arms racing, right? All of these things that are, of course, heightened dangers, proliferating weapons to allies, allying with unsavory regimes, repressive regimes, right? We're suppressing their own workers. Um, and then they use national security as the, like, the sort of thing that legitimizes it. All of that, all of that is rationalized in US foreign policy because it's what allows us to counter the next closest rival, and we must counter the next closest rival because we are committed to this aim of primacy, and we have told ourselves for a generation that US primacy is a global public good. And it's that circular, self-exculpating self belief that has led us to feel like we have no choice. Our back's against the wall is how the Washington crowd feels. I just got back from DC. Very frustrating place, um, and yeah, like they think that they think they're they're going on the offense in every way, and they think that they're like fighting from a defensive crouch or something. Like their minds are warped. Um, I should probably stop. That's Sorry. Good. Can I just jump? Yeah, in? go ahead. Can I just jump in on a thing? On a thing? Um, you know, Van said that the way the United States is, has portrayed rationalized privacy is by treating American domination as a global public good. And you hear this endlessly, you heard this so much um, throughout uh, the war on terror about how you know, the United States was expending blood and treasure, as Amal mentioned on this pretext of uh, spreading democracy is this thing that um, we told ourselves that we were doing and, and told the world that we were doing. Um, and in fact, um, I have a piece coming out um, soon on this, but um, the ways in which uh, the United States rationalized doing things that um, you may not do when you are not the primary you know, global power um, are really on display now. And I'll just mention um, one because this is you know, so unignorable at this moment. Um, last week, uh, with the strange acquiescence of the United States, uh, the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution uh, demanding an immediate ceasefire in Gaza through the month of Ramadan and hopefully leading uh, toward a permanent ceasefire. The United States and Israel immediately set out to arguing that that rather, you know, the thing that much of the world has been working toward for six months was, in the words of um, the, United the US ambassador to the United Nations, um, not just in ineffective, uh, non-binding, uh, was the word that she used, uh, meaning that it had no force. And now, all of a sudden, you had this demand expressed by you know, the duly expressed elements of international law um, conflicting with the prerogatives of Israel and its patron, the United States. And for this entire era of primacy, 
um, a term has emerged um, to, uh, the Biden administration uses this one a lot, uh, but not exclusively now. But this term has emerged um, to kind of describe what the United States' is allegedly benevolent hegemony provides to the rest of the world. And they call it the rules-based international order. And the rules-based international order is a term that sounds a whole lot like international law, right? Like you might think of it as a kind of informal way of describing like the complex mix of institutions and legal rulings and fora and so forth um, that underpin you know this delicate lattice work that makes up you know our our you know blue and, and you know tilting planet. Um, in fact, um, you know, and oftentimes uh, the rules-based international order, as when it corresponds with U.S. interests, um, I'm sorry, when when international law corresponds with the interests of the United States, the rules-based international order is fine to just sort of you know promote international law and this or that ruling and so forth. Um, when those interests diverge, the United States is the exception to international law and determines what the exception is. Um, many of you will remember in 2011 um, when uh, the dictator of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, threatened genocidal action. The United States, the UK, and France, which had long found uh, Gaddafi to be um, an irritant, were able to assemble um, an international mandate um, that then they, you know, went beyond to, you know, cap Gaddafi. And that was something international law was fine with when it corresponded with the interests of the United States. Over 32,000 people in six months have been killed by Israel in Gaza. We just now got one resolution calling for a ceasefire during Ramadan and the United States set to work ensuring that it won't have any impact. Um, whatever the kind of overly personal hostility exists now between the Biden administration and the Benjamin Netanyahu, well, he's not even, he, this man is an island at this point, but whatever the overly personalized um, disagreements between Biden and Netanyahu, the material reality of American support, American military support, um, American economic support, and American diplomatic support exist for what the International Court of Justice said in January were plausibly genocidal actions by Israel. Israel now having defied um, what many didn't even really see as a, um, a, a kind of order to desist by the ICJ, nevertheless there are some of those. Um, was what prompted, you might have read about this, the UN Special Rapporteur for the Occupied Palestinian Territories, Francesca Albanese, um, saying that there needs to be an arms embargo around Israel. Such an arms embargo would be really typical of what happens to regimes the United States does not like or um, does not feel uh, the need to protect um, when they perform actions like this. Uh, instead, the United States is setting to work making sure that international law does not um, touch the Israeli actions in Gaza. And I think what we are seeing a lot of now, um, we saw this manifest itself um, when much of the world would not respond um, to United States entreaties to help um, the uh, obvious victims of a Russian aggression in Ukraine because the way the United States has acted on the global stage, um, particularly in places that have been on the receiving end of American power, are not interested in hearing about the need to support um, a US ally or a US protectorate under um, the demands of international law. This is not a plausible argument for the United States anymore. And as we drift further and further away from unipolarity, I don't believe we really have um, and anyone who thinks that the U.S. empire is on the verge of falling should take some, I am not saying this is a template at all um, to um, speak to Amal's point, but like empires 
take a long time to fall before falling really rapidly. Um, I don't think we are at the end stage here. I don't, you know, all of this nevertheless, um, to say that as multipolarity unfolds over the, court, over the coming decades, there are alternatives to the rules-based international order of the United States that will present themselves. There will be contestation, there will be resistance of that order. And then ultimately, at a point when the United States is no longer the dominant power, the unchallengeable um, dominant, you know, dominant military and economic power, the United States might find it longs for the protection of international law after it had spent its unipolar moment hollowing it out. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a lot there's a lot to think about there. And, and Spencer, what I really appreciated about your book, which I had not read until recently, Reign of Terror, which is not going to be my go-to book to assign for students who really want to understand the kind of post-9-11 insanity that took over in the US and the kind of legal changes and the, the consequences of those domestically and also the US actions internationally. Uh, it's really quite amazing to kind of read over it, you know, especially when we're supposed to now focus on great power competition and forget about kind of the global war on terror, which as you correctly said, continues to haunt us in so many ways, uh, not just internationally, but domestically. But one of the things you, you point out in your book is the kind of bipartisan consensus, which emerged at that time. And, you know, we just had Joe Lieberman yeah. die a couple of days ago. He was instrumental in the Department of Homeland Security formation and the, also the Islamophobic discourse that accompanied that, that moment in time, which is quite, um, uh, quite evil, I have to say, <laughs> in so many ways. But, um, go back and read a lot of what was written around 2004. I, you know, we could go, you know, further back, but the way it persists, and I, I I'm sorry to cut you off, Omar. I just, you know, there is, uh, Joe Lieberman ran for president once. It was insane. Um, I worked for a magazine called the New Republic that actually endorsed him um, against the entire will, the, the united will of the staff and even the ownership. Uh, because of uh, Lieberman's championing of the war on terror in a manner that gave, um, wasn't even really super believable at the time, but like um, a democratic, cap that's capital D, democratic party legacy um, to the war on terror. Um, he writes this article uh, for the national interest uh, in which he's basically like laying out his foreign policy campaign. He talks about the importance of rallying the world to fight Islamofascism. And you're never really going to get anyone to define what that means. <laughs> but around the country, you knew exactly what that meant. You knew who was getting put like under the targeting sites, not just internationally, um, in the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, but also entire communities in the United States that would be placed under permanent and inalterable suspicion. And the ways in which Lieberman built the mechanisms like the Department of Homeland Security that to this day ensure that collective suspicion is not merely a social problem, it's a security problem meaning that entire communities live under threat of investigation, of sanction, um, and ultimately imprisonment. And that is how, you know, how, how readily the United States war on terror took root, uh, to speak to Amal's point, um, tells us a whole lot about where democracy in America stops and about what democracy in America will accommodate. Well, speaking of that, I wanted to ask you about the, um, I mean, we've had now five months or so of a brutal war in, in Gaza and um, protests all over public opinion polls, international consensus um, that seemingly Biden has been immune from uh, somehow, at least I say seemingly because we don't know what's happening and there's a lot of you know, counterfactuals that we don't know, but at least 
you know, thinking about how you know foreign policy seems increasingly removed from public pressure, and you know, how can we understand that in the framework of U.S. politics? How can we kind of understand that first to sort of, sort of then think about possible alternatives and ways we can actually influence it? So much there. Um, so I tend to think of these things both the top down and the bottom up. And so thinking of it, you know, in terms of our, our structures or our, you know the, the top down perspective, um, the executive was never meant to be especially accountable, right? This it's part of the design of the Constitution. The executive is very much buffered from what we would call vertical accountability or. Um, the vertical checks. Those would be checks from public opinion, from the people, from, from uh, based on our desires. Um, so the U.S. president, probably more than most executives, is very, very buffered from that. And the system was designed actually to rely on uh, horizontal checks. So um, checks from Congress. And Congress was meant to have, uh, the, the, you know, the doctrine of congressional supremacy on, on foreign policy. Now the interesting thing about that. Is, uh, you know, it started out that way throughout the 19th century, and then uh, starting in the 20th century, throughout much of the 20th century, that really shifted, and the executive started becoming untethered from these congressional checks. And there's lots of debates, that, lots of uh, debates from constitutional scholars about whether or not this is contradicting the Constitution. That's actually not the most important part or most interesting part. The most interesting part is that there was no contention around it. In most situations where the executive is stripping power from legislatures, there's gonna be some serious regime contention, they're gonna put a fight and it's gonna be a whole thing and constitutional crisis. There was actually very little contention. You know, Congress puts up, every time this, there's this creep of executive power, Congress puts up this kind of half-hearted fight you know, you get these little flurries. Well, no, war powers are with Congress. No, we can't, the president can't send troops. The president can't do this. But there's no serious uh, obstacle to the expansion of executive powers in this area. So the US president has extraordinary executive powers, um, really pretty much unmatched. And part of it is this inter-party collusion that, that you've referenced. Uh, it's not just consensus, I would say. It's, it's very much collusion when it comes to areas of foreign policy. So that brings the bottom up. So from the top down, everything is, and, and I'll say, you know, there are lots of areas where Congress has relinquished powers to the president, including budgetary areas. That makes absolutely no rational sense, except that it relinquishes them from responsibility and doesn't, there's no way to hold them accountable if the powers have been transferred. So there's been a con you know, progressive transfer of power to the executive to buffer even Congress <coughs> from um, this kind of accountability to the public. Because you think, well, you know, shifting the politics of the executive takes tremendous mobilization, but perhaps trying to find the levers in Congress, foreign policy, you know, committee in Congress, uh, they, they do less and less. And so that, be that makes Congress even less accountable. And then you take the bottom-up perspective, right? So if you are an ordinary citizen, and I spend a lot of time trying to think of, you know, what do we do in, in, in the situation as ordinary citizens? And something that's come up in, in both of your comments, you know, in different ways, but I think is really central, is how we define interests. And when we look at, you know, when we study uh, political participation and mobilization, one of the things we, we, we look to is how people come to define interests, and usually, it's relying on signals from parties or other intermediary organizations. Lots of organizations provide signals to you about what is in your interest, and they do this on economic policy, they do this on all sorts of things, because you as a citizen, it's really hard to figure this out on your own, or even to you know, weave your way through the many different policy positions that one could take. So you rely on parties. Um, but what, you know, I, I did this exercise of trying to go through the different party platforms on foreign policy. And what was very interesting about this exercise, first of all, they say so little about anything. Um, there's these really broad brushstrokes, but even more than that, they provide no way for you to figure out what is in your interest. Right, so even if we set aside ethical considerations, which we should not, but even if, let's say, we're, we're not gonna worry about the ethical considerations of, of our actions and our foreign policy. Let's say we are just trying to figure out what will keep us safe 
There is no way to figure that out looking at these these parties' platforms. There's no way to so even if we set aside the ethical considerations of a potentially genocidal assault in Gaza, is this going to keep us safe? Is this alliance? There's no way to even weave through that. So what do you as a citizen do in trying to figure out what's going to keep me safe? Or what, and, and it produces this kind of, you know, what you've described as this kind of irrational position where people think, well, we've got no choice, we've got our backs against the wall, um, because it becomes extraordinary diff it's extraordinarily difficult to even figure this out. So then, you, you know, areas where you, you find points of leverage, and you've seen a, a tremendous mobilization around Gaza in places like Michigan. This is a super clever strategy. Right? This is a swing state where we know 10,000 votes have decided the election, and there's significant mobilization to put pressure on a presidential candidate for foreign policy purposes. It is a very clever strategy, and I would you know, highly endorse it where, where, where we can. I don't think it's a long-term strategy. I don't think it's a broad-based strategy, because thinking like a party, their next move for the next election is going to be to find a different constituency. So without more widespread mobilization along these lines in other swing states, in non-swing states, without a broad coalition, even this, what I think is a really effective, and it's not just the, the electoral strategy, you know, there, the, the United Auto Workers came out and it, with a call for a ceasefire. They didn't join this, this, this uh, electoral mobilization, but maybe they would. Um, I think it's a great start. Um, but it still requires a shift in our thinking, and this is something that I know security and context is very committed to. Um, it, it requires them not just to rely on these ethical considerations, but to identify for people, where is your security, actually? And how, do, how does it tie to these broader agendas and redefining this idea that primacy is in your interest or, or whatever you know constellation of interest has been given to you? These things are taken as given, right? They're, they're not questioned. And the more we can problematize what we define, of, what, how we define our interests, and do it for multiple constituencies. So if you are someone who is deeply committed to human rights and, and humanitarian causes, and that's going to motivate you to take action, then we will, we will bring you along. If you are someone who really wants to make sure that, that this, this area that you call home is, is secure. We need to offer you a different narrative for what's going to produce that. And I truly believe that these things will ultimately go hand in hand. These aren't separate tracks. Right? There aren't separate logics behind ethics and, and self-interest. Um, and so, but I, I do think it has to be offered up in a really specific way. Yeah, so I want to ask you in a second, because I know you wrote an article about the United Auto Workers and the ceasefire and, and kind of a working what a working class foreign policy oriented foreign policy might look like. But I also want to uh, just start telling people if you have questions, uh, start thinking of them. Um, if you have any on your mind, just raise your hand and Liam will come and get your question. And I wanted to, you know, just given what Emma mentioned, ask where you guys see the glimmers of hope in terms of what social forces might be there that kind of can push us in a positive direction. I know Vanny just came from DC, so we're not very hopeful. Yeah. But you know, if we can think of that, where where, where would that lead us? Um, I'll just take you know, I'll take two really quickly, and, and, and they're the two just mentioned. Um, first, uh, the new leadership of the United Auto Workers is doing something both overdue and very radical, um, and I don't mean just about Gaza, but I'll get to Gaza in a second. Um, I mean in terms of actively uh, recommitting for the first time in more than a generation the labor movement to recruiting and especially organizing in hostile areas, areas where the legal structures um, are, are, stacked, rather, are, are stacked tremendously against labor organizing. And this is, um, an enormous and potentially historic change um, within the labor movement, and it is um, the sort of thing that um, inspires a lot of copycatting, um, and we can probably expect to see that. Um, and a lot of that um, increased um, uh, labor organizing is not just the result of this new uh, leadership at the UAW, 
it's instead a reaction to, you know, put, you know, put your, you know, pick your starting point where you want, but decades of successful attacks on organized labor that have left ordinary people um, exposed to the ravages of capitalism um, in ways that I don't need to tell your generation, um, previous generations would have found um, absolutely intolerable, but we're, you know, the frog that's been boiling in water for a while. Um, but we're, you know, I talked to people in the UAW um, who had signed on to a ceasefire in Gaza, and among the things that they stressed to me was that this was the beginning of a reassertion of the UAW to give labor a voice on foreign policy, to speak to the ways in which foreign policy um, is undemocratic in the most material way there is. And what do I mean by that? Um, I don't want to overstate this, because this is a very inchoate thing. Um, but there were regional managers within the UAW who I spoke to who represent thousands of workers at munitions plants um, in Pennsylvania um, and, yeah, Pennsylvania. And they are, you know, they, they need to do two things. They need to preserve jobs for their members, and they want to start like real conversations among their members about how they can start compelling the companies, GE in particular, uh, to make other stuff than weapons for the military, um, to make stuff other than weapons for the arms export markets. If we can introduce democratic structures, democratic interventions within the military industrial complex, that will be more seismic than in any electoral structure, I believe, because of the realities of the the realities of, of how weak American democracy is, in particular in this issue. And the second one, I don't disagree with anything um, you said. Um, you're right. Um, forcing um, a kind of vote of no confidence in Biden isn't a long-term strategy. Um, and the Democratic Party will have lots of ways, whatever happens in November, um, to adjust and push itself um, to what its donors want as the status quo ante. But oh my god, in the absence of having any, you know, because there's not a contested primary, in the absence of having any electoral way of dissenting and um, showing that so much of the country is not um, okay with supporting a genocide. What I think is so smart about the organizing, it's not just in Michigan, my, my home state, New York, there's a campaign also to, you can't even write in a candidate, so there's a way of doing a kind of not quite undecided, I forget exactly what the mechanism was, but um, the memes will have all of the explanation you need that I'm blanking on. Um, but that's gonna happen in New York as well. Um, I would not expect New York to be, you know, the tipping point like like Michigan is. But nevertheless, this is showing to the Democratic Party internally um, that its voters are not willing to do what 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 it wants, and it doesn't even have to affect the outcome of the election. What I think is so clever about um, you know what Michigan has done um, has been to put electoral pressure to institute a policy change. Like this goes away if Biden simply stops providing military support to Israel. That is asking a tremendous amount given the realities of what the US-Israeli alliance is. Um, I shouldn't say alliance, I should say patron-client relationship. Um, but nevertheless, there's, you know, much like with what we're seeing in this resurgence of um, you know, labor zeal, it's the end result of not having had any voice in this regard at all, and it will not be silenced right now. Yeah, just two related thoughts on all of this. One, I think the uncommitted vote, especially in Michigan, agree, it's a brilliant, what I think is actually a tactic, creative, and amazingly nonviolent, you know, and, and and democratic. But a tactic is not a strategy, you know. Like uh, elevating a tactic to a strategy 
every once in a while you can do that and it may make sense, but generally speaking, that's not smart, right? That's not ineffective, you know? So there's gotta be a larger wager that this is part of. And what is that larger wager? We still don't really know yet, you know? Um, the other thing, as a source of optimism, but certainly not in the immediate term, um, or like what's a potential pathway to a better kind of world, jumping on this, um, you know, breaking the back of military Keynesianism thing, like extracting militarism from our, from our national economy. In the 90s, and this goes back to the perniciousness, this is why privacy is such a damn problem. In the 90s, when it was all unset, the world was unsettled and uncertain, you know, it wasn't inevitable that we were gonna do this privacy equals global public good, you know, our leadership of the world benefits everybody thing. That it, it wasn't necessarily gonna go that way. Because it went that way, we rationalized limiting how much we cut defense. And with this, this was, there was a moment in time of which my friend Charles Knight was like in these conversations and doing analysis in fact. But there was a moment in time when peace conversion, defense conversion was a serious major analytical project where tons of policy research were done, crunching numbers about how you can convert this militarized economy into a basically a peace economy, a functioning, a high functioning, high job, high wage economy without, so you can do it without harming workers, right? And all that shit got shut down because we didn't need to cut defense as much as initially thought because we found new reasons to keep it going. And the Cost of War Project at Brown has this uh, great research where they show dollar for dollar spending on the military has a lower job multiplier effect than a dollar of spending equal on any other sector of the economy. So our, our fates economically are actually being held hostage by military Keynesianism, by the, like the war economy is a bad long-term play for lives, but also for like the American economy. Oh, and so fixing that would obviously be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's, it's, it's at Brown and also at UMass Amherst, actually, a lot of that research on uh, the uh, alternatives to military spending uh, was done at the Political Economy Research Institute at, at UMass as well, with Heidi Peltier and, and Bob Pullen. So. Oh, yeah, she was the author, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so, yeah, so very important. I mean, we have time for questions. If people have, Liam, if you don't mind going around, maybe you can start at the back, take a few. So you guys talked about um, the uh, the kind of transition and reporting away from foreign policy. I mean, I've been writing about and reporting on studying American elections since I was like a teenager, not very long ago, but still. Um, what do you think the war in Gaza and kind of in connection with that, the war in Ukraine and American participation in both of these projects is doing to American international relations, American foreign policy outside of these individual nations and like the broader international economy. Because I feel like I've heard so little about what's actually going on in like the UK and the, the Australia, like these major military partners. And I don't know how they're reacting to these different issues. It's, put, it's putting our allies in a tough spot because America is kind of alone on this. And you can see that in the UN votes. It's like us and Israel, and like, that's basically it. I mean, even, clo even close allies like us. Australia might be like America's best partner in the world right now. And yeah, I mean, Australia even trumps the UK right now. You're gonna be building a whole lot of defense stuff in Australia. Yeah, <laughs> Australia is the future of, of American primacy in a way. <laughs> There's a longer conversation there, but even- You thought it was just bluey episodes. <laughs> <laughs> but even, even super friend Australia is uh, on the recognition of war crimes in Gaza, you know? Like, they, they, they're not gonna believe it. America's like, you can believe me or your lying eyes. And Australia's like, come on, man. I mean, even Australia. So America's alone, and so people who wanna rationalize American power, which is our security allies foremost, they're in a tough spot because their civil societies are like, we're not about to be on the wrong side of the genocide. You know, no, right-thinking right people cannot be. And that's gonna end up having impacts on them. And currently, governments are doing this awkward dance 
where it's like, oh, our traditional partner, America, you know, you still have to elevate the, the partnership and do these arm sales quietly and all this stuff, but in the meantime, they're simultaneously being like, America's fucked. And also, the Trump might just be right around the corner and we need a plan B. So like, currently, they're worried more about the plan B, what if Trump wins thing, than the, what is the implication of being allied to a supporter of genocide. But it, they're both a problem. So there's this fantastic speech that you can look up um, at like a Norwegian think tank um, by a um, Russia scholar named Fiona Hill. Um, she was a kind of non-political national security uh, bureaucrat um, on the White House National Security Council um, during the Trump administration, but is very much not a Trump person. Um, and like Fiona Hill is, you know, a member in good standing of, you know, I think the primacist camp. It's very, yeah, like, you know, a very respected mainstream, um, you know, proponent pretty much of the structures that we've been here criticizing. And she's giving a talk about um, the way in which, this is a couple months ago, uh, this is about a year ago, in fact, um, the rest of the world just doesn't want to hear what the United States is saying about Russia. It doesn't want to hear what it's saying about, doesn't want to come to Ukraine's aid, and is talking about, um, you know, with a great amount of persuasion that, you know, the United States makes other nations decide that its enemies are their enemies. And that's a prerogative of privacy. And she was talking about how like everywhere she had been traveling recently, the 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 fury at that, like you, Ukraine kind of snapped it. It was just like, we're, we're, we're just not doing this. Um, there's something that I think the United States really doesn't want to deal with unfolding in what the US media kind of lazily calls the coup belt of West Africa, which is like a tremendous amount of Russian resources coming into a region that's basically sort of saying, like, you can, you know, you are not getting a good deal out of your security relationships with the United States, and perhaps there's a better deal available. Um, imagine what the response is going to be like after Gaza, the next time the United States has one of these Ukraine style asks to meet. I happen to personally think that whatever, you know, the circumstances were, that you know the United States over the course of you know many many years twenty five years basically with NATO enlargement you know operated in a provocative sense toward Russia nothing excuses the blatant aggression of invading another country and I don't I don't think that you know should ever be either rationalized or or, or lost in this discussion the suffering of the people of Ukraine is extremely real the suffering of the people of Gaza is no less real and has been going on for much, much longer. And the world has a register of reacting to that that understands that it couldn't be happening without the support of the United States. And the way in which that is manifesting, like um, like Van had said, is, is going to be a really profound, I think, you know, this, this term gets kind of thrown around too much, but um, an inflection point um, in, in how American power um, is able to gain adherence absent coercive measures going forward. I'll just offer a couple of brief comments. That, that I, I can pose this question to you both, but I wonder often how much of our perception of the current moment is based on how completely out of step Biden is. And you know, Biden is an old school liberal internationalist. You know, emphasis on old. It's, it's like you transported him from 1945 in the Cold War and then there's Russia and then, so his thinking is is really just it's out of step with the rest of the world but I wonder and, and you, you're you more on the ground with this, could there be a generational change after this point? How entrenched are these doctrines actually and how much of you know, our perception of how entrenched they are is the result of looking at Biden and him, like he believes this 
that's 100%. He, I mean, this is how he thinks. This is really, and he's been there for all of these conflicts. So his thinking is so colored by a world that, in a lot of ways, no longer exists. I do. Yeah. I mean, I want us to take a few more okay. questions from the audience. Okay. That's a very good point. I mean, the point is one percent. If Israel didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. So I mean, his kind of this strategic relationship kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Liam, do you mind? Uh, let's take a few more questions in a row, and then we'll kind of. So I would not ever usually be the first one to ask a question about electoral politics, but since this was what the panel was about, I have two things. Uh, like, a, like a jerky question asker that I am. But the first one is about electoral politics and partially it's because we talked about Michigan and you mentioned Lieberman, so I feel like I need to put those two together somehow. Um, I'm really interested in thinking about whether the issue of Gaza could influence the outcome of the upcoming uh, presidential election in a way that foreign policy usually isn't as much of a deciding factor in presidential elections. Um, and, you know, I, I, I appreciated, too, of all what you said about Biden's old school oldness. Um, and, um, and thinking about that, the tactic in, in Michigan, in Minnesota, and elsewhere, um, that really does show the, the power to possibly swing the election, I am brought back to a moment that did involve Lieberman, because it was when he was on the ticket with Gore. Um, that was an election in which, you know, as a person around in my early 20s, I voted for Nader and was chastised, you know, like, you know, this is why Gore lost the election. It's because people voted for Nader and they ruined it, you know. And a lot of us, one of the kind of things that people said at that time is like, this was also partially because Gore put Niederman on the ticket, you know, it's like the Democratic Party didn't take responsibility. And so I'm, I'm nervous about the outcome of the election. You know, I, I'm not seeing that, that Biden will really, like, change his mind. And as much as I feel like it's, it's kind of unfathomable to think about voting for Biden at this moment, um, there's also Trump. So, you know, it's a weird moment. So that was one thing, number one. And then thing number two is just, you know, my, you know, the way that I think about foreign policy comes through the lens of somebody who studies literature and culture. So especially when you bring up this kind of conception of foreign policy um, ban um, as, um, what was your line again? The, you know, we've told ourselves that primacy is a global public good, which feels like just, you know, that can be maybe out of the 80s, but it just being this older, the, the idea of like the innocent abroad, the you know, American abroad, it's always like, has this idea of goodness that couldn't fathom atrocity. Um, just has come up over and over again since the 19th century and has really felt like it's always that, that thing. <laughs> it always feels like it's such a barrier. That ideology or just way of seeing the world really is a barrier to breaking through um, the, you, you know, into something that might be beyond that primacy as you're talking about it, but just um, the imagination of U.S. empire and its, and, a hope, and its hopeful demise at some point. So I'm just wondering about that, that idea as, as an obstacle. So I guess I have uh, two main questions, really. One of which is uh, more about foreign policy, and then one of them is more about electoral um, politics. So the first one was something that was sort of um, mentioned uh, in the uh, opening, in, in the introduction provided by Omar, that may have been talked about, maybe I, maybe I missed it, but perhaps it could be elaborated more on as to what a, uh, as you said, a more progressive, holistic, and inclusive foreign policy, foreign US, US foreign policy would look like, what that would look like. Uh, and then the second question is, um, with, so, so with um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and with uh, Cornel West and, and um, uh, Whoever wins the Jill Stein, yes. So there, there are a lot of third-party candidates uh, trying to make a splash in this in this electoral um, in this most recent elec election that sort of I believe represents a larger malaise in the American populace with the two-party duopoly. And my question. Uh, is do you think there will come a time where there will be any significant 
third party. I mean, maybe it is this election. I don't believe that any of these third party candidates will will receive a large enough percentage of the vote. Maybe they maybe they will. But do you think there will come a time eventually where a third party candidate does? But the thing is, is so two things get kind of wrapped up there, um, and it's a good question. Um, one is third, and the other is party, because like. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. doesn't have like an infrastructure outside of wealth, you know, that's, that, that would like outlive him. Like similarly, Cornell West like doesn't have a movement. Um, there, you know, it will take organization in order for that to happen, especially considering like how entrenched this duopoly is in, in, in ways that like function legislatively in ways that are, you know, written into, you know, state laws that have to do with, you know, maps set up specifically to produce certain election outcomes um, that will also have a lot to do with voting rights. Um, that organization is is like step one. Without it, it you know, it, the, the, the candidate can be as charismatic as possible and, you know, I, I doubt we'll ever actually win. Um, but the infrastructure is what's really needed if, if that duopoly is, is, is going to actually get broken up. Yeah, Emmanuel Wallerstein was like the godfather of world systems analysis, and he, he saw politics in, as something that was like embedded in history and that evolved over, like, you couldn't separate power and politics from the historical conjuncture in which you're thinking about it. And the reason that matters is because he saw electoral politics as basically a defensive tactic. So it's like something that you do, which I feel like right size is what it is. It's not a stand-in for democracy. It shouldn't be elevated and venerated as a substitute for the will of the people. It's a defensive tactic. And while you, while, if what you really want is political and economic democracy, that's something you have to fight for on many fronts, and the electoral politics is only one tiny front, but you don't not fight for it. So of course you vote, so of course you like you make those calculations, but if you let those calculations consume you as the entire game of fighting for a better world, then you've lost, you've been captured. I can just jump in on two of these electoral questions. Um, the first, um, uh, you know, the, the issue of whether or not this is a, 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 an important leverage point. I want to say it is extraordinarily difficult to identify accountability for the executive on foreign policy. Um, so it's one of these areas where you get massive foreign policy failures and nothing happens. People aren't voted out. Not, really, nothing happens. It's bizarre. Like you get a downturn in the economy. People are responsive to that. But foreign policy is this area where the logic is kind of unfalsifiable. And what I mean so when we talk about the, the idea of falsifiability is how do you know if you're wrong? Right? It's a very basic like principle of scientific research. How would you know if you're wrong? And in the area of foreign policy, it seems unfalsifiable. Every failure becomes evidence that you need to become more hawkish. You need to dig deeper. Or if we weren't, you know, so aligned in this way, it could have been even worse. So it seems like it, it, it's resistant to that kind of uh, what is meant to be a responsible government. You fail, you get voted out of office. I, foreign policy is an area where, where you don't see those linkages as strongly. You get massive failures, and then people dig in even more, sticking with the same failed policies. So there, you, you know, I, I do think you need a very more fundamental attitudinal shift, and I agree with my colleagues here that electoral politics isn't enough. It is absolutely essential, though. So I don't think we can let go of electoral politics. I do think we need to you know, be a lot more savvy and strategic about how much of a lever this actually is. So you, you see already, with the situation in Michigan, already the Democratic Party is looking for new constituencies. So Biden's trying to kind of placate some constituencies with gestures here and there and dropping things from the sky that are supposed to help God. I don't know what, what, what that's supposed to do, but simultaneously they are looking for new constituencies. So it's a game in both directions. I think it's a very effective tactic, as you've said, but the party also has its own tactics. The manipulation of electorates 
is democratic politics. That is entirely what they do. Mobilization is a manipulation of the electorate. Who they, what doors they knock on, who they talk to. So these things are part of the process and we can't assume that, that our mobilization is going to contradict that, but our mobilization is important. One final thing I will say, and this makes people very sad when I say it, but there's not gonna be a third party. Our electoral system does not support a third party. Um, there are you know, situations like Canada and the UK where they're very idiosyncratic things that are allowed small third parties to emerge. In Canada, it's the Clavacroix issue and, 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 and the concentration of interest there. The US political system as it stands, our electoral system, isn't going to support a third party. So there have almost always been two stable parties. However, they're not the same two parties. We've called them the Democratic and Republican Party since the you know, 1830s or you know, 1850s when the Republican Party came in. They're not the same party. We've had different parties. These parties become completely transformed and they can be transformed. And that really should be you know, the focus of our energy as much as, as mobilization. How do we shift these parties? If these are our vehicles, if, and, and I do, I study parties, I believe they are absolutely essential, um, but they also should be the target of democratic politics. Can you give like a 10 second explanation of why the two party system is fixed, why you can't have more? I think that you're right, but just as a, as a primary. Uh, so without nerding out too much, I love electoral systems. It's a very strange thing about me, but uh, the electoral system is, uh, you know, first past the post. In any system where within the district, only one seat is available. The logic of political formation is going to, it, it, they say it's, it's a, a D plus one, the, the, the number of seats in the district plus one. So if the number of seats available in the US as a district for the presidency is one, you're gonna get two parties forming. And we have that not just for the presidency, but for House of Representatives, it's a little different for the Senate, you get two per state. Um, but you would have to increase the number of people elected to support multiple parties because it costs a lot to mobilize as a party and there are other ways to influence politics. So we have two major parties, but we have lots of influences within them um, because instead of forming a party, you can form a lobby group or you can form a, you know, parties within parties. But a separate party it, it, it's very difficult to sustain because you're never going to get close to that half plus one threshold. Right, uh, thank you all so much. Any last words, answer, Van, before we run out the panel? Um, I'll just say if you wanna find out more about what a progressive foreign policy might look like, read Van's book. Yeah, we forgot to answer your question. <laughs> no, I'll say quickly. It's in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It adds. It, this pulls from the book, but basically, the the reason I wrote that was in in 2019 and 2020, I was working as a unpaid advisor to like a bunch of the Democratic presidential campaigns, and it was a bunch more than one because my candidate kept losing. But I, in that process, I was on these foreign policy teams where, for the most part the teams and the candidates were genuinely looking for alternative thinking on foreign policy, recognizing, acknowledging on some small level <coughs> that uh, there were valid critiques to be had of liberal internationalism of the status quo of Washington foreign policy. And so they were like open to alternatives and in those moments there was no there was a sense, in, in, there was no foreign policy alternative that was expressed in the idiom or the grammar of the national security state. Which is to say, like, there's an agenda that occupies the mind of the national security technocrat. You know, Taiwan, nukes, deterrence, Iran, that kind of stuff. And there was no foreign policy agenda that was expressed in a language that these technocrats could understand, that addressed the issues specifically that they cared about. Uh, and so I was told multiple times by multiple people in multiple campaigns, there is no alternative. And I, I know you've heard that phrase before. And the, the feeling of like, 
I, I had been I'd been in parts of the progressive movement at various points, and I knew about all these critiques that I, I was reading up more and more on them after my experience with the Guam thing and the new crisis. And I was like, bullshit, there's tons of alternatives. What are you talking about? Like, all these critiques are the basis for alternatives. And they just weren't packaged in such a way that like the national security state would be forced to take it seriously. And so that's where that book actually came from. It's like, this is my desperate attempt to expand the imagination of these war machine people who are, used to be my friends. Uh, he would have been marrying Williams national security advice. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. This has been great. Thank you all for coming. And uh, on this Friday evening, afternoon, we do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you.